back to the Learning Clinic on CKLU 96.7 FM. I'm your host, Bob Kerwin, and you're listening to another edition of the Learning Clinic Meet the Candidates radio show. This afternoon, I have Mike Leske, who is running for the position of counsel in Ward 11 in the studio. Mike, welcome back. Welcome, to. I'm, I'm thankful to be here. And, and Mike, you're, you're just finishing up at... Uh, Cambrian and you're actually coming to Laurentian next year, aren't you? Yes, I am. Um, actually, I'm just uh, finishing up my advanced diploma in public relations over at Cambrian and uh, finishing up my uh, my time as the uh, vice president of the uh, Students Administrative Council there. Um, I've, I've been involved there for the past little while and now that I'm transitioning over to Laurentian, it's uh, providing me you know, some new opportunities to uh, jump in and get involved in different places. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's an interesting, and speaking of jumping in and getting involved, you're, you're getting involved in a municipal election campaign. Absolutely. <laughs> so so tell us a little bit, who, who is Mike Blesky? Uh, in, in, you know, the, the people in Ward 11 are going to be looking at the choices that they've got. Who, who is this Mike guy that uh, is running? Well, when... If, if you're looking for who Mike Blesky is, and I hate talking about myself in the <laughs> third person, but um, I um, I would describe myself as just a, a, a young person with plenty of ideas, somebody that can cooperate with people around the table and, and bring those ideas from, from young people and really merge them into the, um, the ideas that the rest of the community has bring that all together and, and hopefully provide a, a different perspective uh, for Middle Lake and for uh, for New Sudbury as well. And, and in terms of the young part, uh, I mean, you do have experience mm -hmm. in well, governance. Um, yeah, um, being in student leadership for the past few years, it's it's really been an eye-opening experience. Uh, Explain that. You, you in well, student leadership as, uh, as what? Well, the, uh, the Students Administrative Council is uh, one of three student governments uh, over at Cambrian College. So okay. there's, there's SAC, which sort of acts as the catch-all. Um, there's the uh, Cambrian Native Students Association and the Cambrian Athletics Association. And all the students at the uh, main campus of Cambrian are members of all three. But um, in terms of what SAC does, we provide you know, a variety of social opportunities and academic services that just complete the, uh, the Cambrian experience. So regardless of what you're doing in your classes, you need to have a life outside of that and, and have a good work-life balance or else you're never going to enjoy your time in post-secondary. And that's what our goal is. Our goal is to make sure that students are living the Cambrian experience, that they feel satisfied with their with their academic environment, with their social environment, and are able to enjoy their time. And um, you know, there's there's many different ways that we do that. We operate um, the uh, we operate the food bank uh, for the uh, for the college. We do uh, all the social activities out of our student owned uh, student center pub, um, and that includes celebrity meet and greet events and. and DJ nights and those sorts of things to get people out. Um, we have services for mature students. We have those services for uh, students that are facing difficulties with teachers or, or grades that they felt were unfair. Um, and, and you can really run the whole gamut of, of services that we can provide. And that's that's where I've been involved over the past while. Um, and, and that's that's what you kind of expect out of the student government is that support that you need to provide for students. So you're really operating and you've really been involved in something that is, uh, it, it's no different than what a city council would mm -hmm. be overseeing in terms of the kind of services you're providing for the community at Cambridge. Absolutely. So, so you're, it's, you're dealing with the social aspect, you're dealing with recreation, you're dealing with, with mm -hmm. uh, things that are not all that happy about and you're trying to balance the academic and, and the uh, social life of, of students so they enjoy the quality it's, of life. It's, it's very really much like running a city. Yeah, it is a microcosm of, of what a city council is like. Yeah. I mean, obviously the services are much different. You're dealing with emergency services oh, yeah. and, and you know basic infrastructure with city council, but uh, the lessons that you learn in, in, in judiciary duty and governance are, are pretty much the same principles. 
and I would dare say even the advocacy work that we are able to do for students, not only at Cambrian but across the province, really matches up with the kinds of ways that city councillors are expected to advocate on behalf of their residents. Uh, for example, um, we, um, we are a member of an organization called the College Student Alliance, which is a group of uh, over 20 student governments from across the province, and we get together and we deal with issues such as tuition fees, such as international students, uh, uh, First Nation students, uh, mental health especially has been a big focus of ours. And um, one of the most awesome experiences I've had um, has been to travel to Queen's Park to lobby directly to Kathleen Wynn uh, talk to her about the issues that students are facing transitioning from high school to post-secondary. Uh, that must have been an interesting meeting then. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it, it's a little nerve-wracking at first considering, you know, you're, you always think of yourself as a student first and, and this is a strange place to find yourself on a, on a May afternoon, but yeah. but it was it was certainly a very fulfilling and, and rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. I was no more nerve wracking than listening to the drilling that's going on behind. Us. So hopefully, <laughs> well, the, uh, the sound is not coming through. But it'll pay off in the end. Yeah, yeah. If you can get by that drilling, then you can get by anything. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I just wanted to bring up that whole experience thing because quite often when people look at um, at candidates for council, there, there's this wanting change, there's this wanting youth, there's this wanting age, and and really, regardless of what your age is, it's the experience you bring to the table. And I think you probably have more experience than a lot of the older people who are, are running for council because you've actually been in a parallel situation where you've been, it's almost like it's a, it's a training ground for anyone who wants to get into mm -hmm. a larger, or, or, or I guess a, a more advanced mm -hmm. governance system. Everybody so. has their own life experiences, mm -hmm. but I like to really think that mine, mine stand out um, and, and the student leadership that's come out of Cambrian over the past decade or so is just unbelievable. Um, uh, one of our past presidents um, is now working for the Conference Board of uh, Canada, uh, and before he was working as a, um, as a uh, research chair for, um, for Colleges Ontario. And uh, we have uh, people that are working as, as top real estate agents now that are working um, that, you know, in different sectors around all parts of, of the province. It's great. It, it's amazing to yeah. what kind of experience you can get and, and where it can lead you. So the candidate for Ward 11, Mike Bleskey, what, what are you finding? What are, what are some of the issues that you think are, are going to have to be addressed, whether you've got positions or answers on them, I mean, feel free to share them, but, but what, what are what are seem to be coming to the forefront? Well, I just wanted to uh, pay special attention to an issue that's been coming up over the, over the past few weeks, and um, I believe that it should be somewhere on the council table tomorrow evening, um, and that would be the issue of Second Avenue. Uh, now, for those that that's don't live in... April 29th, they're dealing with, okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, now, uh, for those of the uh, those people that don't live around uh, the area, Second Avenue is sort of a main connection between the Kingsway and Bancroft Drive over by Cambrian Ford. And the idea was that um, there needed to be infrastructure upgrades to that street. Um, it's been a long time coming. Uh, the uh, the amount of residential growth in the neighborhood has definitely grown significantly, and we. Um, We've seen some uh, needed changes, such as the open culverts that are on the street. Um, now, uh, funding was announced by the city to redevelop Second Avenue from Donna Drive, which is uh, around where Boston Pizza is, okay. down to Kenwood, which is around uh, the um, Brookdale Village uh, residences. And um, so far, it's been a very interesting experience, considering that um, the, the input coming from the community has been very vocal as compared to some other projects. Uh, the original proposal um, consisted of uh, five lanes uh, of traffic um, 
and uh, also involve no uh, bicycle lanes. So currently, when, currently is what, what is there, two or three? There's um, three lanes, right? Or, yes, three lanes um, from Donna, and then there's a bend heading towards Scarlet Drive, and in that bend, it, it reduces down to two lanes. Okay, so there's going to be a, a, a huge it'll, it'll traffic be, flow. It'll be a change for sure, and, uh, and there's different uh, schools of thought. Um, I've been involved with the Community Action Network and, and what the Community Action Network has been calling for is um, three lanes of traffic um, all through the project area and, um, and the city has called for now five lanes from Donna to Scarlet and then three lanes the, for the rest of the project area. Um, the, the first consultation that went on um, and there was a there's a, there was a big issue over bike lanes, um, and and the fact that there were no bike lanes built into this this artery, which would connect Minnow Lake to New Sudbury uh, with bike access, uh, basically, and um, at this point in time, um, the city has thankfully you know listened to the input from the community and, and built in bike lanes, but there's still the issue of five lanes. Um, now, talking to John Lindsay, who's been on this program before, okay. yeah. um, he feels very strongly about um, about the five lanes um, coming in, and would rather see three lanes. Uh, I myself am of the same belief that there's no there's no real need for such a wide amount of traffic, um, and and I worry about the bottlenecking that would. Um, take place between Scarlet where it shortens to three lanes and to Kenwood which would reduce to two lanes and then the short amount of time that it would take for you to, to merge um, that's my that's my main issue with the with the project right now it, um, but um, at this point um, you know the city's put a, a lot of work into this project and um, I, I, I trust that if they if they're very um, um, you know, um, firm with this decision for five lanes, it could be workable. There, there are some things that can be done as ways to uh, to calm traffic um, and and keep the flow going, uh, which is the entire point of the project is to make sure that traffic is no longer bottlenecking. But um, you know, there's still a lot of conversations going on. Uh, the most recent being um, a roundabout being built at the corner of 2nd Avenue and Scarlet where the access to the dog park and the cemetery would be built. Um, now that that is something that the can is proposing and based on my conversations with the residents that live on Scarlet as well as um, as well as uh, Camelot and on Greenbrier the uh, there is quite a bit of skepticism towards a roundabout yeah, I was gonna say that would generate a lot of conversation. I, I, I um, it has so far um, so that, that conversation's um, going through right now. I'm, I don't really see a roundabout as being a feasible option for Scarlet. I'm not, I'm not completely anti-roundabout, it's just that for Scarlet it's, it's a very impractical option and, and there are a number of reasons that have been stated to me by the residents in the area of why they would rather not see a roundabout. Um, but um, John uh, is, is certainly you know putting the case forward and, and so are other people and I would love to see some more open conversation uh, continue on that just to see you know the firm stance of, of people in, in the neighborhood that are actually going to be using that intersection on a daily basis so so that is one issue in that one ward that is pretty significant in terms of the people who are there and, and in terms of connecting the city because it's a, it's a route that's going to be used. Absolutely. And there have been two um, sort of consultation sessions that have gone on about this project. Um, they've taken place at Adams Hill Playground. Uh, I know though that um, there was a lot of concern about the, about the lack of time to sort of really talk about the project before there were proposals um, put forward um, and, and you know that's going to be an issue with a lot of projects that go on in, in Greater Sudbury 
the city will have to do their their own homework and, and present it to the citizens, and citizens will have to be able to take a long, hard look at what, what's going on and, you know, say what they really feel about their, what they want in their community, because in the end, they are the residents that live there. They know what is best for their everyday life in yeah. terms of yeah. traffic and, and accessing their roads, in terms of the services that they're receiving, yeah. et cetera. I, uh, I can't remember who it was that mentioned it on one of our recent shows, but somebody said that, and I'm almost, I'm almost positive it was Jim Gordon who used to say this, but he used to give advice, that you have to really listen to the silent majority mm -hmm. when you're making decisions on council. And, and it's, it, it's one of the challenges, because when you hold the public meetings, mm -hmm. the, the people who actually come out to the public meeting, you know are coming out because they have a, they're, they're motivated to come out to the meeting. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, it's not a lot of people that come mm -hmm. out. Which is, which is why you need to actively seek out and talk to people um, on your own time. How do you do that? Uh, just, just Are there things that you've already started to do to try and put that in place? Knocking on doors, chatting to my neighbors, those sorts of things, making, making calls here and there. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm going to be picking up that process across the entire ward, but um, in, certainly in, in hot spots where there have been issues, you know, that, that takes precedence. Are people receptive when you uh, ask them for their opinions? Um, sometimes. Uh, it can, you know, it's, it's always varying on, on, on a, what a person feels about politics in general. Um, when, when people actually realize, though, you're, you're trying to discuss issues rather than, you know, why you should vote for me, um, I think the tone changes a little okay. bit and that certainly helps the process but um, it's the only way that you're going to get the, the people that are in that silent majority to uh, to engage and to provide their input yeah. and I think that's a it, it becomes a, a it becomes a real concern for a, a council where you've got 12 people representing more than one person who is uh, overseeing everybody and mm -hmm. not coming from any particular ward, but they do live in a ward, mm -hmm. and and so you got 13 people who have to consider the needs of 13 different or 12 different areas, and that issue on uh, the construction on Second Avenue is a huge issue, and, and yet it's not it's localized to one little yeah. space. So right. you have to you have to be able to um, to really talk to the other councillors and, and plead your case or else you're not going to be getting the support that you need. Yeah. And and that's that's what happens in, in a system where it's purely based on, on uh, geographical location. Right. You know, you're going to have people saying, well, you know, if you if you back this proposal from me, you know, I'll um, keep an eye out for projects that are in your area. I'm, I, I don't know if that happens right now at the council table. I don't, I'm not a mind reader, but um, you know, you open the doors for that to happen, um, so so you have to really be careful. And, and I'm sensing from the way you're being very tactful about this that you don't believe that that's how we should be making decisions at council. We, we should be making I decisions. Think, based I think I think that there needs to be a, a process where we can review our, our current system. Right. And I know we discussed this last time, but I think it would be good to bring it up again was the whole idea that, um, you know, with a hybrid system, you do have people that are, you know, watching out for the entire city and they don't have a very localized agenda, but at the same time, you will have people that are, that are in your area that are defending your projects, that are defending what you need. Um, and, and you can go to your at-large counselor or your, or your uh, ward counselor and take both approaches so that way, you know, you can feel better represented. I kind of like the idea of, of defending the process as opposed to defending the decision. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in terms of what you're going through in Second Avenue, I think that if the other uh, 12 people casting votes can sit back and say, they went through the right process, they got the community consultation, the councillor who is in the area has indicated that he 
explored all of the options and did communicate with not just the people who came out to the uh, public <coughs> session, and at the end of the day the recommendation is being made, then I think if you defend the process, you have to get away from, well, I'll vote for you if you vote for me next time, and just say, you know what, you did the process right, and that, when it comes down to deciding on a project in my ward, I'm going to follow the same process, and hopefully everybody will say you followed the process. It's it's about due diligence for mm -hmm. sure, and uh, you know once you've come to a decision, it's sort of it's sort of a matter of providing a united front, um, yeah. and that was an important concept that I learned, which was, mm -hmm. um, you know, once once a decision has been made, and, and, and the majority have have made that that commitment, everybody will you know back up that process so that it's successful. Yeah, you don't undermine it. Absolutely. Yeah, well, and that's a good. That's a good thing. That, that's a very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting process. It's not finished yet. No, no. But <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, you you just have to take one look at the at the council votes that have gone on in the past, where you've had tie, two tie votes in a row where a motion has been lost. You've had cases where where a councillor has voted for and then against the same motion. Um, some there's yeah. a little bit of indecision. There's a little bit of disagreement, and mm -hmm. and and all of that mixes together to form this this. I don't know what what you would call it a stew of defeat. I kind of like the idea though that that some councillors are not afraid to vote differently when they get different information, and, and I'm hoping That's, I'm yeah. hoping that when when you make a if if I make a decision on yeah, one you, meeting and I get new information in the next meeting. I hope I'm not afraid to change my vote. Exactly, you can't, you can't, you know, hold on to a decision that that is no longer relevant to the conversation. Right. Um, Just and, because people are going to say you change your vote, you change your mind. Well, no, I change my mind because there's new information. It's common sense. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. So it's and, it's good. It's you've had that experience. Very interesting. What? Um, any other um, big issues? I I know from a generational standpoint. The, the demographics, and I mentioned this uh, with, with our last guest, Ty Bud, that I, I really, I, I, I admire David Foote and his Boom, Bust, and Echo mm -hmm. book. Uh, and when you take a look at our, gen our demographics in Sudbury, we have a, a high number of people who are in their, are, are in their, their early parent generation. They're, they're mm -hmm. basically the, the children of the baby boomers, and you've got the baby boomers. And both of them have such different needs in terms of recreation and and uh, and 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 it, and it covers the entire you know spectrum of services, right? Um, and and even even like with my generation where we haven't settled yet. Um, and what I want to see is, you know, we we should be able to invest in programs that are going to be able to bridge the gap, and um, and that's something that I'm very proud of uh, promoting. For example, I take a look at the doctor recruitment strategy that uh, the city has has pursued over the past uh, several years, and uh, thanks to the school of uh, medicine that has been built here at uh, Laurentian, and based on uh, based on the amount of money that we've been able to put into the program, we've actually met our target of recruiting doctors to set up their practices here in Greater Sudbury and area, so that way the people that are aging and, and reaching you know past retirement age are able to see a doctor and not have to wait on a waiting list for a doctor or or wait you know three months for an appointment uh, so that's that's something that I want to expand so when you take a look at our aging population um, you know an average age I think the last census said 48 um, you, you take a look at that population they have they will have different needs in terms of me the medical services that they need, uh, in terms of hospice care, uh, mobility care, and if we were able to expand our the uh, the program offering to those kinds of workers, so social workers and um, you know uh, hospice workers, uh, mobility specialists, and keep them in Sudbury where they are contributing to the needs of the older population in Sudbury, then we're creating jobs. For young people, which is the, one of the biggest needs these days, and then we're providing the services that are most essential for our seniors. Right. That's that's just one 
kind of strategy for, for matching needs and, and creating that kind of relationship. Right. So um, building a, a new healthcare economy here in Sudbury, I, I can see you know an entire generation not having to worry about their jobs and worrying about you know how are they going to work or having their needs met. Absolutely. No, it's good. It's 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 a good. And, and you know, quite often when you are sitting around a council table and you've got a, a lot of different perspectives, you know, we, we have that perspective of we've got to take care of the needs of our seniors. And, and coming in from a, a, another generational point of view, saying, well, okay, then let's do that, but at the same time, let's, let's promote this kind of a, an industry, mm -hmm. which will take care of the needs of the, the young people starting out too. It makes sense when we take a look at a long-term vision. And that so that's where you know your your job creation comes into into play when you're when you're really looking at what kind of jobs you want to recruit, and what kind of in infrastructure you're building, you keep everybody in mind, not just the not just the young people or or you know a certain industry in mind. Uh, we've we've been a mining, you know, a mining town since the beginning. Is that right? For and and the the, 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 yeah, the ability for us to really adapt and become a lot more mobile in terms of our, our job offerings, it has paid dividends. We, um, we no longer look at, at Sudbury as we did in, say, 1978, where, you know, a labor disruption could practically shut down the entire city. Um, you know, we, we came to the, the labor disruption that happened with Valet just a few years ago. And you could you could see that the impact on the city, although you know was significant, it certainly was not the same kind of impact that it would have had in the '50s, '60s, and '70s. Mm -hmm. So the ability to have a diverse, um, you know, job offering for all ages, it, it builds communities. It really does. Yeah. No, it, it, yeah, absolutely. I, interesting that we're we're talking about some pretty long-term vision uh, uh, structures and initiatives. Mm -hmm. These are not things that uh, will end with uh, the next council. Oh, the, the, the absolutely kind of things not. that you're talking about are, are and it very long-term. It can't. No. No. You need, to, you need to be able to have the leadership to not only pursue the short-term uh, strategies, but also the long-term ones. Mm -hmm. And that's been, that's been something where Sudbury has been lacking. Yeah. We haven't had the political or emotional will to pursue long-term projects that are going to benefit our community and, uh, and, and really prioritize the projects that we want. We, we come up with 20 different ideas that we want to pursue and none of them come to fruition because there's, there's not enough time invested in, in a project or there's just not enough will because there's so much, much going on both in the short term and the long term. So, picking and choosing our battles um, are, are going to be important. Sure. So that includes a long-term infrastructure plan yeah. to make sure that our roads are finally, you know, uh, put put to rest. Um, yeah, good, good <laughs> luck with that. If you got the answer it, to that one, it, yeah, that that's the million-dollar question. Yeah, but that's um, going around the country, and, and that's that and that's why it's a long-term discussion. Um, but you know, coming coming up with stuff for healthcare and infrastructure. Um, a, a taxation strategy, our development strategy, such as the downtown master plan, as well as uh, the, uh, the the city's master plan. Um, if you can, if you can prioritize what things you want to see in, in there, uh, whether it be you know a convention center with an OHL arena, and focus on that rather than you know building new major arter arterial roads. You know you can go places. Mm -hmm. It's going, to be, it's going to be interesting. Like the, this whole convention center, it, obviously it's coming up again. It's, it's not something that's the, ever going to die. It's, uh, well, the Synergy Project, the Subbury Synergy Project is working hard on it. And, they, and um, I'm, I'm really happy with the, uh, with the progress that they've made so far. They um, discussed the new pri um, private-public partnerships that they've come up with. Um, they're looking at about 60 community partners right now that they want to work with in order to get this thing built because you cannot depend solely on municipal or, or government um, funding for these projects anymore. 
No. It has to come from more than one source. So for them to be upfront and say, we want to build with private partners involved, it, it's a good thing because then that means, you know, that provides the impetus for other projects to do the same. Yeah. And, and I think that's probably the way it has to go. It's, it has to. We, yeah. we've, we've had uh, discussions about building huge multi-pad uh, rink facilities that have swimming pools and everything else related. It all comes down to, in order to get the private partnership, there has to be a return. Mm -hmm. And in order for a private investment, there has to be a, a, a profit mm -hmm. return. And, and, and that's where the difficulty is going to come in. And plus, it does provide sort of a yardstick for projects. If you know that a private partner is willing to invest in a project and, and put some time, effort, and money into it, you know that the project's most likely worthwhile yeah. to pursue. Yeah. So that's, that's another important thing. We're not just building projects for the sake of building projects. Mm -hmm. We know that these projects will yeah. benefit the community, benefit individual residents, and grow businesses. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons why I, I'm, I'm really kind of glad that we're, we're transitioning into more of an education-based political climate now where a lot of the focus is on educating the members of the community so that the decisions that they're asking their representatives to make mm -hmm. are, are educated, informed decisions because, I mean, you can get into the emotional debate about whether we should be building a, a four-pad arena with a big 10,000-seat uh, 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 complex. At the end of the day, that you're faced with, if you're going to get a private company to come in and do it, then they have to be earning a profit. Now, how do they earn a profit where the city can't? Because the city's subsidizing. And there are ways of generating revenue, but but there's so much behind the scenes. And, and I, I was explaining in the last show that one of the things that uh, that we had when we uh, uh, maybe it wasn't maybe it was talking off the air, but we had a project ready to come into somebody about 10 or 12 years ago and the, the big stick there was that the private company was going to put up all the money to build this big complex but they wanted a guarantee number of hours where the the ice was being rented mm -hmm. at the rate that they needed to make a profit in order to do that they wanted the city to charge the outlying areas the same rate so that the outlying areas were not at a competitive advantage mm -hmm. for them. And so you can walk into one of these things and say, we're not going to use any of our local tax dollars. However, any of you that are going to use this thing are going to be paying twice as much as you were before. And at the end of the day, what is a tax? Mm -hmm. So as counselors, you may be looking at these really nice projects and say, yeah, everybody wants it. But yeah, where, what's the what's the financing like? What's, what's the, the financial cost? structure? <clears throat> and what is the long term cost? And and uh, and so that's that's where the the long term thinking. And I, I'm really I'm really liking that. I think we're starting to trend toward let's make long term plans that may not benefit the existing council. <clears throat> may not give you any kind of extra votes at the next at the next uh, election, but they're long term plans that are going to go on for 15, 20, 25 years once they're put in place, and, and uh, that's in the best interest of the community. Absolutely. Not just who's going to win the next election. Absolutely. Any other uh, issues that you've been uh, coming across in uh, your believe discussions? There? Well, I mean, obviously the, the number one thing that has come up when I've talked to community members has always been... You know how how has council been been functioning? It's it's so it's 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 shocking to to see you know that such an issue has become the hot button issue. Right. That's a major issue. When we get along when you have when when council is the major council issue, then then that's an alarm bell. Right. So that's that's something that we'll have to be addressing. Um, last uh, last time I was on the show. Uh, we were we were discussing you know different ways in which people can collaborate with council and how council can collaborate with each other. Uh, one thing that I had proposed was um, an online system uh, similar to um, uh, it's like a, civ a civic engagement tool where citizens register they can um, 
take part in this online tool where they make proposals. They discuss it amongst themselves and then vote on the proposals. And it's all done within this model. Um, and then those proposals are sent off to council if they're successful or not as suggestions. Um, that way it, it helps give politicians the ears that they need on the ground. And at the same time, it provides citizens a, a, an extra forum for them to make sure that they're heard. Um, so much so that with this tool, and it's called, Lic um, I believe it's called Liquid Feedback, um, it's based on a model where there's proxy balloting. So say you have, you're talking about different issues, but you're not so familiar with issues that have to do with, uh, we'll say, we'll say, you know, arena maintenance or that kind of thing. You can actually give your vote to another person on the system um, based on, on their opinions and their um, knowledge of the subject, and they will vote on your behalf. So that way, the vote is much more liquid in it reflects the whole idea of opinion leaders in the city, not just in council, but outside of council. Um, the same thing goes with our budget. There's a, a budget tool that's actually produced right here in Canada. It's used by, I believe, either Montreal or Laval, um, as well as other cities in Ontario and Quebec and, and out west. Um, and it, all it is, you put together a, um, a basic model for, for your budgets, um, with different questions that you ask based on, you know, delivery of services, whether this service should be offered or taken away, uh, how much money should be invested in this project, and it's basically, ba like, it's on a sliding scale, so that way you know if you want to push something but you don't have the money uh, for another, you can make that adjustment and you can go into a deficit or you can go make a balanced budget. and. You, su you can submit it so that the city can review it and see where people's opinions lie right on the budget. That's interesting. It, it's very much like, uh, I guess, what the referendum is doing uh, this year. Pretty much. Year. It's, it's, it's basically a, a referendum tool that's online and it's, and it's specifically for budgets. Okay. And it's much more in-depth than a referendum could ever be because you're just asking one solid question that, you know, it um, it's it's yes or no, and then you're you're kind of stuck with the decision. Right. With this, you can say, well, people tend to feel like less money should be invested in this, at, like at, at, and it can give you a range. Right. So you know what kind of range is, is acceptable to the people that are that are voicing their opinion online. Right. It's uh, no, that, it, it sounds like a wonderful tool. Something that uh, definitely should be considered. I, like I know the, the referendum issue with the, the store hours, obviously that's going to be a, something everybody talks about, but uh, just what everybody I've talked to, all the candidates who have come in here basically take the same position, is that whatever the vote is, that's what their vote's going to be. And if it's not a 50% it turnout, then it's not going to be mandatory, but the issue has to come up in council and the vote is more than likely going to be according to what the majority voted in whatever number of people that came up. Mm -hmm. uh, I've taken it one step further and, and basically said, you know, it, it, whatever the majority vote is in my particular ward has to be the way I voted council. Mm -hmm. and, and if my ward votes differently than the overall majority, so be it. Because mm -hmm. if I'm representing them and they've actually cast ballots, how can I go in and, and vote differently? Than what they've cast. I'm really looking forward to seeing the results. I really am. Mm -hmm. It'll be uh, it'll be interesting, and I'm looking forward to seeing the results in the different parts of the city. Absolutely, because it's not going to be the same. I, I can see, I can see uh, a real difficult time coming up if we don't get fifty percent, because uh, individual councillors are going to have to take a good hard look at at what their constituents voted in their ward and what the overall results were. Mm -hmm. And yes. I know, I know I've, I've seen a lot of people on, on both sides, but particularly in Sudbury, um, you know, where, where a lot of that, um, a lot of that uh, commercial activity is going on, you know, there's a real um, amount of input coming in where, you know, they want to see uh, a, a successful uh, referendum for, for, you know, expanding those hours. Um, 
So I, I, I really look forward to seeing the results and, and mm -hmm. being able to, you know, vote on, on whatever whatever residents do feel like. But I'd rather I'd rather out. see the turnout be over fifty yeah. percent. Yeah, I'd rather have the people yeah. directly decide. Yeah, that, that would. Uh, I mean, that solves it totally. Uh, so, so that's going to be an interesting uh, battle. That's going to be an interesting uh, discussion. And, and and I hope that there's a lot of discussion because one of the uh, one of the the things is that again, there's a silent majority out there. Mm -hmm. There, there's like there's a person like me that says, well, you know what? If the stores are open, I'll go. But if they're not, I won't go. And I don't really do much of the shopping anyway. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, it's not as important. Now, but I can see other people who would have a whole different perspective because their needs are different. Absolutely. And, and then you've got the needs of the, the independent store owners who are already working 80 hours a week, and you've got the, the, the people who are looking for part-time jobs who would like to get more hours. So uh, I don't know. It, it's like this is going to be a tough one. And I, it, it's uh, you're right. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the results. The um, the education in Sudbury seems to be doing well. There's there's uh, that, that education sector is growing. There has been an uptick in uh, enrollment, which has been really good to see. And uh, actually, it's uh, very interesting that it came up. I know um, today, um, Cambrian employees are supposed to be getting some information on. Uh, uh, the leadership of the college, which is going to be very exciting, oh, okay. um, and and I'm sure that that will be out in in the uh, in the very near future, and I look forward to seeing the new Cambrian president. Um, but um, no, the education sector ever since ever since we really pushed forward Laurentian and and Cambrian and Boreal um, in in the '90s, um, it's been a worthwhile investment seeing Sudbury come up as an education center. So, um, it is, it is. And, and, and I think one of the, the, probably the challenges we have is finding residences for the, yes. uh, the students coming in from what a town. That's, it's, you know, you can grow and grow to a certain point, but if you're going to attract students from out of the area, you have to have a place for them to live. Well, to be blunt, it sucks. <laughs> it's, uh, you're, you're right in the heart of it, so I mean, you, you know, you see people, the problems. People would come into the SAC office and they'd be looking for housing, and you know, we'd get a certain amount of housing uh, listings coming into our office, but um, a lot of the time we'd have to direct them to the Sudbury Red Cross listings, um, where, where people would list um, available housing through them. Um, and it was, it was, it's very difficult for some people because, you know, you have a certain frame of time that between, say, accepting an offer from uh, an institution and actually moving to town, mm -hmm. and, and that can be as little as, you know, four months. Yeah. And, and to be able to find housing in that amount of time, it's difficult because there are a lot of waiting lists. There are a lot of uh, places um, that, that fill up super quick. And, and then and then it drives prices up as well. And you can't accept a position at a school and if you don't have a place to live. It, well, unfortunately, that's the, you have to. Well, yeah, <laughs> but uh, right. but um, it does make things difficult. I've uh, I've seen, you know, people you know they've had to crash on couches where you know they haven't had any place to to live, and and it's become so bad in some cases. I know that there was a, there was a problem a few years ago where houses were being um, tracked down by certain agencies uh, because they were being sublet even though they weren't rated to do so. So yeah. they were splitting up basements into like eight different compartments. Yeah, so set up some bunk beds, basically. Yeah. So setting you know setting up. Uh, Basically, many slums. Um, now, I haven't heard any any major cases of that in the in the past few years where I've been around, um, but I'm sure I'm sure that that's happening at some points, and and yeah, I'm I'm glad that we're we're taking on that issue um, and and making sh and making sure that you know the condition living conditions for students are acceptable. Yeah, I, I can remember many years ago somebody was talking about. Uh, the big push was for for attracting larger conventions. 
Mm -hmm. And you know, one person indicated that well, it's it's okay to try and attract the larger conventions that are going to Toronto, but what do you do on Sunday afternoon at four o'clock when they're all leaving? How do you get two thousand people out of Sudbury mm -hmm. through the airport if you have a large convention? Uh, and, and it's one thing to say you, you want to build a space to bring people in, but will they come yeah. if they're going to have to wait till Monday to get home? And so you're right. into let's let's expand our education and let's attract people from around the, the province to, to our center. That came up at the last uh, Greater Sudbury Development Corporation meeting that um, I was well I was able to attend one uh, recently, and that was where the um, Synergy Project had talked about their their convention space, and I know that came up uh, in specifically in terms of hotel spaces, you know. Um, if you're building, if you were to build a hotel attached to this convention center, you know what what is the capacity that other hotels are going to have for for people that are coming in to these conventions? Right. What kind of traffic are they going to see? Um, and then you'll yeah, you do have to take a look at you know road access uh, out of mm -hmm. town, especially you know with the uh, new highway coming into Toronto, um, and then in the airport, especially shuttles. Right. It's it's the um, the shuttle service that we have right now is I don't I don't think it's at a I don't think it's the peak that we could really yeah. have. I am sure there's another way that we can set it up. Yeah, it's a, but you know, we may be a good place for medium sized conventions. Absolutely. Because we're probably suited for that. Absolutely. Our infrastructure, but to to try to build something where you're gonna attract a two or three thousand we we just Again, we could probably do it, mm -hmm. but how do you get them in and out of town? As a regional <laughs> hub, I'm, um, I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but I think they said that the amount of people that come to Sudbury each year is about a million. But that's also based on the fact that you're counting people from Espinola, Sturgeon Falls, and, and those areas as well as from further right. away. But um, but the number certainly is is significant of people that are coming from okay. other parts of the region and other parts of the province. Yeah. Have we missed anything that you wanted to cover that you can think of this um, afternoon? I don't know. I don't know about this at this time. But yeah. um, like one of the things that we're doing here, and you're you're well aware of yeah. this, is, is uh, it, we're open here. We're we're looking at uh, people running for positions of council. I, I mean, I mean, it is early on, and uh, my platform is posted online. Um, my website is at blesky.ca. Um, but um, in terms, of, in terms of um, you know the issues, they they will continue to develop as as time goes on. But um, yeah, and and I think. But my platform, my platform right now is out there, and um, I do look forward to people contacting me and. You know, giving me their input on on what they see as important and Good. and um, you know what they feel about my platform as well. Good. So. And this uh, this show has been videotaped, so it will be posted on the learningconnect.ca for people to access, and I'm sure you got a link to it uh, from yours. Uh, I think we've we've touched on a number of issues that you can probably flesh out in writing on your website as well. And over the uh, over the next few months, obviously, I'm going to be out there on the doors. But I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm very active on on uh, social media, um, and um, I I really like to hear uh, what people are saying, and, and tr I try and try and keep up with their conversations that are going on there. And and Twitter's actually been a really interesting source of conversations, um, you know, whether it be transit, whether it be the structure of council, um, various little things have come up. Uh, and, and it's always great to engage people in, in a medium where it's very informal and you can get down to issues without, uh, without um, you know, a lot of heated moments, yeah, so to speak. a lot of posturing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good. It's, it's been great. Oh, thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike Bleske, uh, running for council in Ward 11. Uh, I know you will be back at least... Uh, several more times. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to people coming in talking about specific issues like the Second Avenue uh, uh, development. Uh, and, and I know when we get into August, September, October, we'll probably uh, end up with uh, four, five, six 
candidates coming in and just kind of going through and, and, and sharing some of their positions in, in a very educational uh, climate. And, and that's what I, I'm, I'm looking for with this. That's program. what I like about this forum is it's so, you know, it's so informal and it just allows for the issues to flow out. Yeah. And it's, uh, and hopefully the, the voters will get something from it and uh, will be making informed decisions when they go to the Absolutely. And, and that's my goal is to make sure that people have that knowledge. Great. So again, thank you, Mike, for coming in. Uh, people, you're listening to The Learning Clinic on CKLU, uh, 96.7 FM. Uh, we will be back uh, next week uh, with another show. Uh, I believe next week we have uh, Paul Stop Chatty coming in at 12, and we have actually James Tregoning, who is running for the Liberal um, Party in the Nickel Belt riding. Interesting thing about James coming in on the 5th is the provincial budget is coming out on the 1st, so we should be getting closer and closer to a provincial election. <laughs> it, it should be just around the corner. Um, and again, go to the learningclinic.ca, you'll be able to catch this entire interview on uh, video. and. Uh, yeah, let's keep informed, and, and we look forward to the next time you come back. So thanks again, Mike. Thank you. So stay tuned uh, to The Learning Clinic on CKLU 96.7 FM, and stay tuned to CKLU.